Thank you for the introduction. Morning. Um, so I'm Kristina Shinkovic. Uh, I am AI research engineer at Small Robot Company, and we develop robots for agriculture. I am thrilled to speak to you today about semi-supervised object detection for agricultural robotics. A bit of a context. Um, United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization has predicted that with the current growth rate of the population, by 2050, the demand for food is going to increase by overwhelming 50%. Just think about that number. And then think that we have limited land resources. It's not like we can just uh, increase the available agricultural land by 50%. Um, so we clearly need for more efficiency and growing more with less is going to be the, one of the key challenges for agriculture and many industries. So um, how do you get this efficiency? Uh, well, you might think as a first approach, uh, let's use more chemicals, more fertilizers to make the plants grow better. Uh, but we cannot do this at the cost of the environment. Already the um, global costs yearly from fertilizer um, pollution is $800 billion. Now, because insecticides and pesticides are being blanket sprayed across the field, like on that image, about 90% of them are wasted because there are areas, most of the areas don't need treating, only the actual areas where the pests or some weeds, they need the treatment. So more chemicals is not a solution. So what is? Uh, many say it's actually precision agriculture. And there is a wide range of tech in precision agriculture. You've got uh, the satellites that can help you assess the land use, the irrigation patterns, planting patterns, and so on. Then there are drones that can fly across the crop and they help with irrigation, some field sampling, uh, planting, and many other activities. Then you have robotic arms in the greenhouses that can do amazing stuff. They can do automated pruning, picking, packaging, and many more things. And then there are actual robots in the field that can help with per plant farming on a whole scale of the field. Now at Small Robot Company, we fall in the latter category. Um, we develop robots and our goal is to enable per plant farming with these robots. <clears throat> So this is a bit of a video about our robots. Uh, we developed the modular robots that can do different things in the fields, but well, first and foremost is uh, scouting. That is what we have currently in production, and our scouting robots are equipped with six cameras across the boom, and uh, these cameras are high resolution. So they are ground sample distance. In one pixel, you have 0 0.4 millimeters, meaning that you can actually, uh, it allows us to uh, assess each plant, what is the state of the plant, what is going on with it, uh, and are there any pests, and what is the condition of the soil around it. Uh, the surveys are designed in such a way to cover the field uniformly, and then we map each plant to its precise GPS location and display it in a software called Wilma. So with this software, the farmer can look at the entire field, what is going on with it, assess different parts of it, make the decisions, and drill down to even an individual plant if they want to. Um, okay, next slide. Yes, so these surveys allow us to understand every plant with per plant intelligence. And then we can choose whether and when and how to act with per plant action. Now, an example of this would be the rate of emergence of winter wheat. So after a survey, we um, detect each plant and get its GPS location, map it on the map of the field. And then we, uh, we plot the precise density in each of the areas of the field with the hexagrids, and they are colored uh, with um, more. Um, so the green is uh, the higher, uh, uh, the rate of emergence and uh, the red and orange are the lower rate of emergence. So these are the problematic areas. Actually, this area in this field has been prone to slag damage. Um, so slugs <laughs> were damaging the field. They, 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 um, they caused that uh, less plants have actually emerged. 
So then the farmer can look at this plant density and then choose a certain, uh, certain thresholds, whether they want to be more conservative or less conservative. And, um, and then we will produce a treatment map for them for the nutrients. So obviously the area that is, uh, under, that is damaged would need more nutrients to help those plants emerge in a faster way, while uh, other areas of the field don't need as much chemicals. So these treatment maps, we then import in the sprayers. As you can see on the top left, the sprayer has this precise uh, targeted locations where to spray instead of doing the full blanket spray. And this uh, targeted application of chemicals can reduce the use of herbicides and pesticides by 97% based on our initial estimates in the trial plots. And well, in case of nutrients, so far this number is uh, 15 to 40%, but we are working on how to optimize it. We also work on a different type of robot uh, that is using uh, electric weed zapping, to, which is completely chemicals free. Um, so we kill weeds with lightning strikes. Um, yeah, so what do we need for this? How do we do this? All of this rests on well-performing object detection. And uh, as you know, object detection models, they are mostly deep learning, they are data intensive, and um, but labeling for us is quite expensive. If this would be a simple labeling problem, we could just throw more cash at it and have more labels. But in this case, more money is not proportional to more labels. As we get into later growth stages of the plants and more weed varieties, uh, this thus becomes exponentially more difficult. Uh, now, if you compare an image from between November and March, in November, it's quite easy to differentiate which, like each an individual plant. But as it gets laid down to March, uh, it's very difficult even for an agronomist with many, many years of experience. So um, another problem that we have is the class imbalance. Uh, even if we think about a simple problem such as uh, differentiating crop plants and wheat plants, we already have a heavy class imbalance because there is well, a lot of crop, a lot of uh, um, in the field, and few weeds. Uh, you want, hopefully, want them to be few. Um, now, if we want to, we want to treat different weeds in a different way because some of them are very invasive and they are very competitive, so they are a big threat for the crop, and we have no tolerance of them. We don't even want one weed to be there. Uh, and then these are in uh, in orange and like lighter yellowish color are the like meat, meat tolerance. And then for the blue ones, well, some of them might be just there in the field or like we, which we have more tolerance for them. But as you see, this, we get much more skewed distribution when we look into weed classes. And there are some of the ones that are red at the bottom of it. So we have few examples of those. Now our robots, they, um, collect massive amounts of data. They go and take the images um, of which we can only label some part of. And uh, this chart shows us uh, over the course of a growing season, we get many more unlabeled images. So on one hand side, we have this problem of uh, like challenges with um, labeling. And on the other hand side, we've got lots of unlabeled images. So it's just logical to go for semi-supervised detection and uh, use both. Also, if with the growing number of unlabeled images that are taken by the robot and potentially small number of classes that you actually care about, which are rare weeds, doing this semi-supervised object detection brings even more benefits. So our goal, we want to push ourselves as far down the distribution as we can, uh, but obviously we do this one step at a time. So the first we decided to tackle the uh, problem of, uh, and then, uh, of detecting crop plants versus weed, just blanket weed. weed. Um, and so we also decided to share a challenge um, and release the data set uh, with 1,000 labeled images and 100,000 unlabeled images uh, and uh, called it small SSD and uh, we uh, submitted it as a paper that's now under review. So uh, we published the results and um, 
where we compare the fully supervised model uh, with a simple vanilla semi-supervised approach. Um, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the so called pseudo-labeling. So pseudo-labeling is a, a technique where a model produces uh, pseudo-labels on the unlabeled data and then only a fraction of those uh, pseudo-labels are retained uh, whose um, score is greater than the given threshold. Uh, we also use a standard object detection metric, mean average precision, which is measuring how well um, we get the object, so that is object, it's not background, how well, how well we get the class uh, of that object, and also the, the precise bounding box. So that's what this uh, MAP captures. And then we tried different um, architectures, um, uh, uh, single shot multi-box multi detector, retina net, and faster RCNN. And uh, you can see that in like even this simple semi-supervised approach, even trained on small set of unlabeled data on top of labeled, gives us much better results. So it's a promising venue to go for. So, um, okay, we establish, established this work. Now let's look what is in the state of the art of the semi-supervised object detection. And here I give you a map. Uh, you might disagree with some of it uh, because this field is evolving quite fast. But the map of uh, semi-supervised object detection is wide. Uh, the most successful methods currently, they fall within two categories, uh, the consistency training and pseudo-labeling. So consistency training is, uh, is the technique to enforce the model to predict, to, to have similar predictions uh, on the uh, different versions uh, of, of the same image. Um, and feeding the model with different augmentations of the same image uh, teaches the model what is important and what is not to pay attention to. So in the end, the model learns to be uh, invariant to different transformations and pay attention to the actual features of the objects. Uh, pseudo-labeling, as I said, uh, the model predicts uh, pseudo-labels and only a portion of those are retained for further training that pass, uh, surpass a certain threshold. Uh, now, some methods are using just the consistency training, some pseudo-labeling, but the more successful ones use both in a paradigm uh, called teacher-student. And uh, you might have heard about distillation, so it's kind of the same story. Um, so these teacher-students, uh, the research in these models, uh, itself uh, falls in mostly three categories, teacher improvements, experiments with different architectures, and pseudo-label refinement, which itself, like the lower, the, the, the last row, uh, falls, um, focuses on three directions, label consistency, feature consistency, and uh, bounding box regression consistency. Most of the papers that uh, use these methods, they have, um, they were developed, uh, most of these models were developed using standard uh, object detection data sets such as COCO or Pascal VOC. Uh, are, these data sets are used for training and for benchmarking. And uh, while it's good to compare all of these models and establish which one works better, uh, there is a risk to actually overfit if we only keep using this specific type of images that were scraped from Flickr. So what we wanted to do is uh, to develop a teacher-student framework that would work on real-life data sets uh, and uh, would work on any kind of data set. Uh, so uh, we um, introduced a, a, teacher, uh, a calibrated teacher-student uh, student method which uses high-level statistics from the data to uh, improve this teacher-student paradigm. We also released a pip install installable uh, Python package that is based on PyTorch uh, that can work with any object detection data set uh, and is actually quite easily um, extensible. Now, so um, in our methods, we follow the typical teacher-student training uh, 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 sequence. First, we start with the burn-in stage, the one, the thing on the left, um, where we use the labeled data to train a um, fully supervised model. Now, then we use this fully supervised model to initialize, uh, to, we copy the weights from this fully supervised model to initialize the, the teacher model and the student model. 
In, and then during the teacher-student uh, mutual learning stage, we train this teacher and student on labeled and unlabeled data. The predictions from the teacher are then being fed into the student together with the labeled data. And the student is being updated uh, using the gradients, but the teacher is not updated that way. Uh, the, the weights of the teacher are frozen, and they get updated during the teacher refinement stage uh, using mean, uh, exponential mean average over the um, weights of the student. Uh, this is uh, the same like the distillation process, where you distill kind of the knowledge from the student in the teacher. Um, we also wanted to have um, several different um, architectures available uh, to just compare which one works better on which kind of data. So on the bottom row, we have included the architectures such as Foster RCNN, uh, RetinaNet, and then one-shot detectors such as um, SSD and YOLO. So our method uh, differs from the traditional teacher-student uh, setup in several ways. Uh, first is the augmentation. Now, we found that for our data, um, not all the augmentations work. Um, so because all of our classes of interest, they are green plants. Uh, so, um, and, and we have high um, resolution images. Actually, doing any perturbations to color, hue, or scale, they penalize the model. So we didn't include those and only included the uh, vertical, horizontal flips and mosaicing, which is uh, putting four images together um, into one. Uh, then, during the pseudo-labeling stage, we use uh, weak teacher assembling. Basically, we feed the teacher with different versions of the same image and uh, then uh, use a consensus over th these uh, different uh, predictions of the teacher to feed further into the training. And the, here then comes the class calibrated threshold. This is the threshold that is forcing to have the distribution of the uh, pseudo labels match the distribution of the real data. And that is what allows us to have a better performance on any real life data set and not some learned or fixed thresholds. We have, um, we have the results where we compare this uh, vanilla pseudo-labeling and the teacher-student model that uh, we have developed. And um, we compare them against how well they improve the performance over fully supervised. So these are actually the percentage numbers. And uh, across the um, like MAP, MAP50, mean average precision of uh, se uh, 75, uh, we get better performance. We have better improvement, and the most improvement we get in the highest uh, overlap between the bounding box uh, predicted and the ground truth. Um, so this works wor quite well. Um, and also, um, in the previous slide, as I was saying, that we use limited augmentation, you actually can extend it easily. You just like do more transform if you want to use this, uh, this code. Um, then, in summary, um, we had this problem with uh, labeling. We decided to go for the uh, semi-supervised uh, approach. It worked well, and then uh, we um, improved the teacher-student framework so that it actually works on real-life data. It did much better than the previous ones. So the next steps, we want to include more crops and more weed classes. And to push the performance of the semi-supervised object detection models to do well on the rare classes. Another avenue of research is conditioning on more channels. So we would like to condition on weather and soil data and previous crop history so that our models are much more robust and uh, they can perform very well across different ranges of conditions. And well, yeah, you do have lots of different weather and uh, everything going on with the climate change um, in, with the agriculture. So our ultimate prize is the far end of the distribution. And that is bad news for weeds, but good news for you. So <laughs> if you're interested in our research, um, and we also have an internal uh, machine learning paper club, um, and we are planning to make it public, so just uh, feel free to join our mailing list uh, using this QR code or go to www.smallrobotcompany.com slash research um, and just register your interest. Thank you for your attention, and um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you.